This is a show about how atmospheres form, but I hope I can convince you that what they are and why they are is just as fascinating. In fact, they're a real marvel. And of course, if it wasn't for this tenuous veil of gas, we wouldn't exist. But if you're not sticking around and you're ducking into this episode for a quick answer to that tricky pub quiz question, atmospheres form because leftover gas from the formation of a star gets gravitationally attracted to the larger solar system, debris, the planets. And if that piques your interest to know more, hey, stick around. You're all right. So as we said in our video on why the Earth spins that you can find in the show notes below, star creation is a really messy process and there's a lot of gas and dust that doesn't get gobbled up to create the new star or doesn't get sucked in by the new star's immense gravity. And some of this debris is blown far out from the new star by the violent explosion of its birth. And the heavier stuff, the dust, begins glomming and compressing down to form rubble that gloms and compresses down to form boulders, which gloms and compresses down to form asteroids. Where there are enough asteroids close together, they clump together to form little protoplanets. And by the time we have protoplanets, they have significant gravity of their own. And if there's enough debris in their orbit, they'll vacuum it all up, clearing out their orbit by absorbing it and becoming fully fledged planets in the process. And in this regard, planets are just the aggregation of dust. And these fully fledged planets will not only gravitationally attract all the nearby gas, but will be able to hold on to it as a, an atmosphere, that planet's atmosphere, a ball of gas surrounding the planet, held there by the planet's gravity. And one thing that blew my mind at school when I heard it was that gas has mass. You know, I always thought of gas as something light that floats away, but the reality is that there are a lot of gases that make up the atmosphere because these were the gases that were floating around in space until a planet either hugged it in close or that gas got trapped inside the planet as it was forming and began seeping out through things like volcanic processes. And each of these gases have their own weight and the heavier gases, as you'd expect, sink to the bottom of the atmosphere and the lighter gases rise to the top. So on Earth, the lightest gases, hydrogen and helium, float at the top of the atmosphere or escape the planet's gravity altogether and drift off back into space, while heavier gases like xenon or radon sit near the surface until they get dispersed by the wind and break down into other elements over time. And because gravity is the dominant force here, that means the atmosphere is thicker nearer to the surface and gets thinner the higher you rise. So much so that there's actually no boundary to a planet's atmosphere, it just gets ever more tenuous and thinner for thousands of miles until it's barely perceptible. And the amount of gas a planet can attract and hold on to is determined by, well, a number of factors really. Firstly, how much gas there is in that region of space while the solar system is forming for the planet's gravity to actually attract. Secondly, how massive the planet is. And I mean that in its literal meaning, not how big it is, but how much mass it has, because that determines how much attractive force it has on all that gas. So we see that dwarf planet Pluto has a very tenuous atmosphere that we call an exosphere. More massive Earth has a much thicker atmosphere. Even more massive Uranus has a far thicker atmosphere. And the most massive planet in our solar system, Jupiter, has the thickest atmosphere of them all. The Sun, which is a very different beast altogether, doesn't have a solid surface, but it does have a superheated atmosphere made of solar material, mostly gas, bound to the Sun by gravity and magnetic forces. And finally, what determines the amount of gas a planet can attract and hold on to is what external factors are at play. Is it close to the sun where the solar wind is so ferocious it prevents an atmosphere from forming at all, like we see with Mercury? 
has the planet cooled down and lost its magnetic field that protects its atmosphere from the solar wind, which is why Mars once had an atmosphere, but the Sun was able to strip it away. Is it far away from the Sun where the solar wind is weaker, allowing large atmospheres to form quickly like we see with Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune? Mercury and many of the moons of the solar system, including our own moon, have an exosphere, a thin, tenuous layer of gas rather than a thick atmosphere. Vesta, the largest asteroid in the solar system, and Ceres, a dwarf planet in our solar system, don't have enough mass to attract and hold on to an atmosphere, but both have an exosphere. But this exosphere only exists temporarily. They don't quite have enough gravity of their own to hold on to a permanent layer of gas. But NASA's Dawn spacecraft that visited both of these worlds confirmed that a temporary exosphere can be produced by energetic particles from the Sun smashing into water ice on the surface of these worlds. This regularly vaporizes the frozen ice, which wraps around the asteroid and dwarf planet for a little more than a few days before the solar wind then blows it away into space. So if the planet is large enough to hold on to that gas in the glare of the sun, ideally with a molten core to provide a protective magnetic field, or if it's far enough away that the solar wind is too weak to strip the planet of its atmosphere, it'll have an atmosphere for millions or billions of years. Or it may have an atmosphere much deeper than its rocky core, making it a gas giant planet like Saturn or Jupiter. So that begs the question, what will happen to Earth's atmosphere? And we know enough to say that our atmosphere will be around for a long time. Now it will certainly get too thick and hot for us if the carbon levels continue to rise and we'll suffer the same fate as Venus's runaway greenhouse effect. But whether this happens or not, we know the ultimate fate of our atmosphere. In four or five billion years, when the sun swells up in old age, it'll cause our atmosphere to bloat and be stripped away into space by the increased solar wind, leaving us with a scorched, atmosphereless planet. But that's not for another few billion years. As long as we can avoid that runaway climate disaster, don't get hit by an asteroid, kill ourselves in a nuclear war or suffer a much more devastating pandemic than we have done recently in the next couple of hundred years, we'll have the technology to mitigate such disasters and colonise far away worlds safe from the death of our sun. And this is a good news story or a nightmare scenario in its own right, depending on your perspective. And if you want to know how real the threat of an asteroid strike is, you'll definitely want to take a look at this video now. And here's our video on how SpaceX are already trying to make life interplanetary by colonizing Mars. So thanks for watching. Drop your thoughts in the comments below and subscribe if you haven't already.